Hello, my name is Kevin Silber and I'm a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Derby. And this course is a course on the brain and how it functions. In this module, I'm going to talk about the uh, brain and what it's constructed of and some of the functions that those parts of the brain uh, are involved in. Now, the first thing to note is that the brain can be divided into what we call the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which is all the rest of the nervous system. And there's another course that deals with that rest of the, the rest of the stuff and the peripheral nervous system. So what we're going to talk about here is the brain. Uh, the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, but for our purposes, it's not uh, as interesting as looking at the brain itself. Now, one of my favourite all-time quotes to describe the brain is by Stephen Rose from 1973, and he describes it as two fistfuls of pink-grey tissue shaped like a walnut and something of the consistency of porridge. So what you have inside your head is porridge. Now, that porridge is made up of over 100 billion Neurons. These are the cells that make the brain work, the, the ways in which the brain actually functions. And those billions of neurons are structured into hundreds of structures. So it's not possible in a course like this to describe all of them. So I'm going to pick the way in which the brain is structured in its uh, the main ways in which we would divide the brain up and talk to you a little bit about some of those interesting structures and what they do. So we're going to start with the part of the brain just as you leave the spinal cord and come into the brain is an area of the brain that we refer to as the hind brain and this is in evolutionary terms the oldest part of the brain. The hind brain is made up of three distinctive structures and these are the medulla oblongata, often just referred to as the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. So what are these three and what do they do? Well, the medulla oblongata is a structure that's involved in many of the vital functions that keep us alive. So you don't have to concentrate on breathing or making your heart work. The medulla oblongata does all that for you. So it controls our breathing and our heart rate and make sure that they carry on as normal uh, and change in circumstances when they need to. But it does more than this. There are also some other functions that are vital to us that we sort of take for granted but that happen automatically under the control of the medulla oblongata. So for example, coughing and sneezing are controlled by these. Sneezing and coughing we need to do when there are things obstructing our airways. Also, gagging, another one, uh, if you were to stick two fingers down your throat, you would start to gag, and the medulla oblongata would be a response to the blockage of the, of the uh, tubes. So the medulla concentrates on these, many more, but I will stop with these, um, of these vital functions. Now the next part, the pons, a little bit uh, to the side of the medulla oblongata and slightly higher into the brain. Well, the word pons means bridge in Latin, and this provides a sort of bridge and relay uh, for all of the sensory information that's coming into the brain. So it passes through the pons and then gets directed to where it needs to go for further processing. Uh, that's really all the pons does, but you can see that it's a pretty vital function because if things aren't directed to the right places, then those functional elements won't happen properly. And the cerebellum is a little brain in itself because when you cut it open it sort of looks a bit like a brain and it has a cauliflower like appearance and this is a motor structure so this is involved in movement control and it's involved in the motor planning so it controls the various things not not just voluntary motion but things like when we're doing something and the monitoring that makes sure that our movements are correct is partly also controlled by the cerebellum. And there's also a part of the cerebellum that controls 
balance as well. But you can see how balance is part of that whole movement uh, planning control. If you start to fall over, you need to move your arms or legs to right yourself and correct yourself. So that's the hindbrain. Coming a little bit further up, we have an area called the midbrain. Now, the midbrain, in human beings especially, doesn't play an awfully big function. It has a, a number of structures, but, and two are just uh, worth a small note. These are the colliculi. There are the superior colliculi, which are involved in vision and in our ability to see, and the inferior colliculi, which are involved in uh, auditory functioning, so our ability to hear. But they don't play a huge, as I said, they don't play a huge role in humans. But where they do come into their own is in a collection of structures that we refer to as the brain stem. Now the brain stem is the medulla oblongata and the pons from the hindbrain that I've already talked about, and the midbrain added in. And why this is interesting is because it contains some structural elements that are a little bit, they're not like sort of structures in the same way that the medulla and the pons are, but they're collections of neurons that have very specific functions. So for example, the ascending reticular activating system, rather a mouthful of words, but nevertheless, is an area that's involved in arousal and attentional processes. So it's an important area for arousal. And the brainstem contains all of the vital elements uh, in total of the brain in its sort of basic living function. So if the brain stem is severely damaged, it would be difficult for a person to maintain life. Okay, so once we come up through the brain stem, through the hindbrain and the midbrain, we enter the part of the brain that really captures everything, especially for us as humans, but for mammals in general. And we refer to this as the forebrain. Now the forebrain is pretty much the rest of the brain and when you look at a brain and you look at the size of the brain, almost all of the important parts for us are forebrain functions. And the forebrain is divided into two areas. It's divided into an area called the diencephalon and an area called the telencephalon. As well as that, if you look at a brain, then you will see that it has two halves to it and we call these hemispheres. And so there is a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And these are joined together by a band of fibers that run through the middle, connecting the two sides, called the corpus callosum. And we'll hear more about the corpus callosum in one of the later modules. The other thing to notice about the forebrain is that it appears wrinkled, in humans anyway, uh, on its surface. Now, those wrinkles are folds because that way we increase the surface area of, of the brain. And again, I'll talk more about those folds and, their, and what their, their function is when we do a, a later module, in fact, the next module. I just wanted to point out the folds because if you were to look at the surface of a rat brain, you would find that it's perfectly flat. And this is an indication of the increased capabilities that we have as humans over the capabilities of a rat. So as I mentioned, there are these two areas, the diencephalon and the telencephalon. I'll talk about the telencephalon in the next module, but for now, let's concentrate on the diencephalon. The diencephalon has a number of structures, as all parts of the brain do, but there are two that are really worth noting for our purposes. These are the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Now, the thalamus is a sensory relay structure. So similar to the pons, but the pons directs uh, information to where it needs to go, the thalamus plays some role in also processing this information in a small way before sending it on to other parts of the brain that need to um, have the information. And it is a critical relay station and is involved in some other functions as well. For example, it's involved in areas like memory uh, and other areas of cognition. And the other is the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus takes the idea of the medulla one step further. Remember the medulla was about vital functions. And the hypothalamus is involved in a process that we refer to as homeostasis. And the hypothalamus has a role in things like arousal, 
in things like hunger and thirst and also in sexual and reproductive behaviour too. So that's the diencephalon. In the next module, we'll take a look at the, the rest of the forebrain and look at the telencephalon.